You're listening to Richard Pryor, A Life in Comedy. Ron Bennington speaks to the comedians and loved ones who knew him best. I don't want to never see no more police in my life. At my house, taking my ass to jail for killing my car. For the next hour, the life of Richard Pryor will be discussed and examined. But we gotta make some movies, some really hip movies, because pimps, we done made enough movies by pimps because white folks already know about pimping. Because we the biggest holes they got. This is Richard Pryor, a life in comedy. I start off snorting little tiny pinches. I start off snorting little teeny, didn't even make noise. Six months later, and here's your host, Ron Bennington. Welcome to Richard Pryor, A Life in Comedy. I am Ron Bennington. I think Richard is probably one of the most, if not the most, talked about comedian in history. He's been analyzed. The stories have become myth. And the funniest people that you know will say Richard is the best. It really comes down to, I think, of Richard and George Carlin being the two people that people will talk about the most. And um, we've done one of these life and comedies with George Carlin. So it's great to finally get the opportunity because there's some new material out by Richard that uh, has been sitting around for a while and, uh, and you get to hear him prepping for what was going to become a big album for him and it was really at that point that richard was breaking out so if you get the chance to um, hear richard Pryor at the roxy they have it here on sirius xm make sure you check it out this is a bunch of comedians some of the funniest people who've ever lived are going to be talking about richard today we've got kevin hart joan rivers paul mooney who was a very very good friend of richard's uh, Tracy Morgan, Paul Feig, Louis Anderson, Sandra Bernhard, Jay Moore, Jim Norton, Howie Mandel, Doug Stanhope, Patrice O'Neill, Jennifer Lee Pryor, who was the two-time wife of Richard Pryor, Rain Pryor, his daughter, Roy Wood Jr., Marlon Wayans, Derek Gaines, Monroe Martin. Those two guys did a live listen uh, with me of the album where they – we kind of play the, the new material and then break off every once in a while and we discuss it. And Derek Gaines and Monroe Martin were just terrific doing this. And, and Terry Crews, the actor from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. That's a hell of a lineup of people that are still willing to discuss a guy who, you know, a lot of this stuff is from the 70s. Some of the peak material is from the 70s. And um, I think it was Albert Brooks who said like if you if an alien came here and you just showed them the movies they would not know how funny richard Pryor is because he's the real heat the real burning flame has always been stand up here's another legendary comedian talking about richard and what what always amazes me is everybody has some kind of a story about richard when and a lot of times it's um it's a negative that turned into a positive. It's like when he did something, you know, that was less than social and then went on stage and talked about it and it was fantastic. So this is the great Joan Rivers giving us a story about her life with Richard Pryor. A Life magazine, which is not even, wanted to do me as like comedian of the 70s and, I, and stupid. I would never do this now. I said, no, <laughs> you <laughs> moron. No, <laughs> uh, you should do Richard Pryor. He's better. I know. Well, stupid. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> young and yeah. stupid. And I took them all down to see Richard Pryor in the village. And Life magazine only hired handsome wasp men. They were 106 feet tall, blonde, all went to Yale. And I brought this whole group down with me to see Richard Pryor, who is doing <laughs> a discussion on how he had had VD and went into a free clinic and the nurse didn't want to give him the shot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I never saw six wasps <laughs> freeze like statues yeah. and walk out backwards, you know. <laughs> but that's what you were talking about. You were talking about things that were never discussed. That's about Richard early in his career. This is Roy Wood talking about seeing Richard later in his life. 
when certain comedians walk into a room, there's an energy. There's like this aura where they just command respect. I don't know how to explain it, but like when Chappelle comes in a room or Rock or Seinfeld, the room gets quieter and more still because you're watching them. You're just watching them in the back of the room. You're just watching them exist, watching them absorb the comedy. And the only time I ever saw Richard Pryor in person, it was near the back end of his career. And we were at the comedy store and he was in a wheelchair. And, you know, I, I don't I don't speak to the gods, man, because they're gods and you just gods are to be observed and learned from, I guess. And Mr. Pryor went on stage and was killing him, man, just killing him. And it's it's the one thing about comedy that 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 you you know is true is that the good ones do it till they die the really good ones dick gregory died with dates on the books george carlin bob hope you know it's it was it was a blessing to have been to been in his presence and to see and to just have the opportunity to have seen him even if it was only one time and that's one of the the great rising comedians right now and that always amazes me that some of these guys they weren't even around when Richard put out some of his albums, and yet they know that stuff. Uh, rock and roll has that sense of history. Film has that sense of history. But comedy doesn't age the same way. So you could go back sometimes and look at people that were amazingly popular, and the material doesn't stand up. But with Richard, it does. And it's uh, pretty mind-blowing. This is uh, Richard's uh, two-time wife, Jennifer Lee prior people just loved richard he would come on stage and and you know his he was just an open beating heart i mean he could touch people he related immediately and always to the audience i think that's what people really connect to i even rednecks i saw come up to him and i you know i, you know, I know i didn't like n word n word yeah. but now i i like you and i appreciate you and you know he really was able to touch people and that's that funny thing that some people have. It isn't always about craft. It's not to say that Richard didn't have craft and he didn't work at it and it wasn't important to him. There was also something else. You use whatever metaphor that you want, touched by God, you know, blessed, whatever he had. He could go on stage and say some really painful things, really painful things. And it was hilarious. Here's a guy who has been able to do that himself. This is Tracy Morgan. Do comedy like you doing it for the six people in your living room that you always did it for. And that's what it's about, man. Richard Pryor, it was just a funny conversation. I don't do material, man. I'm conversating, man. When you, when Richard talked to us, didn't he talk to us? Wasn't it a funny conversation? And you in your mind, you'd be like, go ahead, Rich. You know, <laughs> and that's what I want. I've never been around Tracy Morgan that he didn't bring up Richard Pryor. He just thinks about Richard Pryor all the time and this is richard Pryor, a life in comedy to say that richard was uh one of the true greats is just it's not enough i don't know if there's a defining way that you could say who you could compare richard to you know was he the chuck berry of comedy that seems too small that's how much he changed things now here's the other thing that was amazing and i think it has a lot to do with the fact that when richard made that change in the 70s from going from an entertainer to a guy who was bringing something else and you would hear these albums it always seemed weird to me that that audience felt hip it felt like the audience was hip just for being there and you know richard was kind of a mainstream pg comic throughout the 60s uh, did very well was playing vegas and stuff like that moved into something a little more radical where he was just playing to black people he had a black audience people would say that's underground but it wasn't with african americans he was an established star with them and then white people found that white people moved over and found that so he had this mainstream audience without having the kind of pure mainstream stuff because it always felt like you could get in trouble when you were a kid for listening to a rich i'm not gonna lie to you you could get in trouble for listening to a, a Richard Pryor album. And so many people were turned on by those albums. Here's Paul Feig talking about what that felt like to hear Richard when he was a kid. These 
albums were just like gold to kind of get, but also sort of forbidden fruit, you know, because we always had things which were called kind of like basement, like basement comedy albums that you would listen to, like old Red Fox albums and stuff like this, which were, they were kind of dirty and they were swearing and all this, but they were so funny and they felt so subversive. And so you'd really have to kind of go and hide, hide in your friend's basement, listen to them. And then the prior albums were definitely that. And, um, you know, it wasn't until later that I started seeing the concert films and all and you know how how brilliant you, you got used to his voice and how he talked and then to see how he acted the things out because on a lot of the albums the audience would be laughing and go like oh i know he's acting something out in a way that's super fun so you know the, once we started getting these concert films that was really exciting to see him actually perform live and to do it it's just so funny to me to hear from a, a guy like paul feig you know a suburban white kid identifying with prior and that is that amazing thing about comedy. You would have nothing in common with, with the guy to feel this great connection, to feel this human tragedy that we all go through. And Richard had that, I think. I think that he showed us how funny the hard times could be. This is uh, a guy from a family of funny people. And of course, all of them love Richard Pryor. It's Marlon Wayans. He's not just inspired me to do comedy, but. I think he's inspired a whole generation of comedians to not just do comedy, but to do comedy based on truth, based on pain, based on experience, and learn to live on a stage and know that that's where you live and breathe. And we kill ourselves when we leave the stage as comedians, but on that stage under that spotlight, that that's where we live. I remember as a kid, my brother used to sneak and listen to Richard Pryor albums. And me and my brother Sean would sneak and listen to him listening to Richard Pryor albums. And we was like, who's that funny man that keeps saying motherfucker and nigga? And my brother told me it was Richard Pryor. And he used to make me laugh. And then I actually saw him do stand up, and it, it blew my mind. And um, I watched his movies and I used to go, man, one day, one day I wanna do what that guy does. And I watch him influence so many people. One of my brother Damon's favorite comedians, and Damon's probably one of my favorite comedians of all time. Um, and uh, if you ever want to do comedy, this is somebody, he's somebody to study because he was the perfect comedian. The, the most perfect special I ever saw to date. Richard Pryor, live. Filmed it in Long Beach, California. It was the perfect special nobody to date has ever done something that great. Marlon Wayans uh, talking about Richard and again, talking about studying him. Has anyone ever studied, you know, Bob Hope, who was the biggest comedian in America for 40 years? I don't think so. I think, I think there's something different about Richard. This is two young comedians that I did the live listen with. And when we had the idea, the comedy department came to me and said, hey, do this, uh, you know, who would you want to do the live listen? And there was talk of having peers or some superstars. But I said, what if we went with the really young dudes? Because I see these guys in the clubs all the time in New York and they talk about Richard Pryor like they knew him. That's how much they've listened to him. And that's become their starting point. And these are the two hottest young comics that are working in New York City right now. This is Derek Gaines and Monroe Martin. I was told stories about how my mother and my auntie were young and they had to go in their room while yeah. my grandma and all her drinking friends would listen to that uh, niggas crazy yeah. in the living room. But they couldn't listen to it, but they put it up and put it, you know, wax. Uh, and you go, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, so it was a thing. Richard was taboo. He was like that. He was like that guilty pleasure. Yeah. I just feel like that's what comedy should be. Though. Right? Yeah. Comedy is, is not this jukebox thing. I'm it's with every, you. It's, it's this weird thing where everybody got to love what you do. It's like, no, I'm supposed to be listened to in the fucking basement when you're yeah. like on punishment. I don't want to be like, hey, do that jingle about chicken. Like, yeah. I hate comedy. Get the chance to listen to these guys uh, on the live listen. Richard Pryor live at the Roxy. Because I'll tell you what's amazing to me. Neither one of these kids was alive when he recorded this. They weren't alive when he did his TV specials. And yet these guys know Richard Pryor 
down to the moment. I just find that absolutely fascinating. Also, this is something that I think we could get lost in when it comes to Richard Pryor. A lot of things people think because he had so much talent that it was just easy, that he just walked out there and did it, and that he didn't have a commitment to it as an art form, as a craft. And I think that's because he makes it look so easy. This is his uh, wife, Jennifer Lee Pryor, talking about the work ethic of Richard Pryor. One of our first dates was we were driving home on cold water, and he turned the car, did a 180. I said, where are we going? And he says, it's a surprise. And by the way, this was after the, the car, shooting the car, divorcing mm -hmm. Deborah. I mean, this is after a few <laughs> disasters. And um, we went to, pulled into the comedy store. He sat me down. We walked in, sat me down at a table, got on stage and started talking about candle wax on the floor. And out of that, eventually it became live in concert. He went there every night. He woodshedded. I took notes for him and we go over them the next day and and he would throw this out keep that expand this and he was very disciplined by the way people don't you know also richard as chaotic as his life could and was certainly at times he was a very disciplined comedian when it came to putting his routines together and his shows together and uh and of course the comedy store was where he did it he loved to do it he loved that room the or he would get on stage and he couldn't not be that vulnerable, open self. That's who he was. That is fascinating to hear. And I've heard it from a lot of people. Mitchell Walters told me years ago that whenever Richard came to the comedy store, just that was his show from that point on. Everybody, and you know, if you, wherever you were scheduled was done. Mitzi's just said, Richard's here and that's what we're doing. And when he would first show up, he just wouldn't have anything the first night. He'd just be up, kind of fooling around. The next night, he would have like a minute or two based on some of the stuff the night before. The next night, he'd have five minutes and the rest of it would be full. And it would go on like that until he had his hour. He would just keep working it like that until he had his hour. This is Louis Anderson talking about Richard Pryor. I watched him uh, work uh, his magic at the comedy store where he came on and get a five-minute standing ovation and then struggle to get the jo first joke and then the next night he would come back and he'd, he'd have a minute and a half more and the next night he would come back he'd have three to five minutes and the next night and so for two weeks he would come every night to both shows and uh, do his thing and then leave with his writers and friends and people who were working with him and every night it would get better and then at the end of the whole run he would have a special and I watched that with his heart wide open, try to struggle and claw his way to find that joke. And he knew when he had it, he'd move on. And I watched him build a special from the ground up. I think it took about, well, he probably had worked on it a long time and had a lot of different ideas. But then he would come out and he would spew all this out. And then he would probably do about 20 minutes the first night, 10 to 20 you know, and the crowd would just like scream out and yell during the whole, you know, first 10 minutes. He was so famous that they couldn't get past the fact that he was there. They wouldn't shut up. He'd go, motherfucker, shut up, motherfucker. And then it would be motherfucker, but in the kindest way. That was one of the first things. And then um, it would take him about two to three weeks, I think. And he was doing it probably at three or four clubs that night. Do you know what I mean? because he would just be at the store, or maybe he just did it at the store, I don't know. But I, all the comics would be in the back, and I went every night. Well, I don't think any of us thought we were going to hear Louis Anderson say, motherfucker, like that. But what an amazing thing that he had. And, and like I said, the stories that Louis told, I'd heard from Mitchell and Carl LeBeau and anybody who was a, a regular at that time back in the comedy store, that he would come in and slug it out until he had his stuff. Here's something that comes up all the time with Richard Pryor, and it's honesty. Honesty, honesty, honesty. And I think it's one of the worst things to take from him. I think a lot of young comedians try to be so honest that they just tell the truth and forget that they're supposed to be making people laugh. You know, sometimes it turns into a sad TED talk. It's almost like if there were TED talks on failure. I think Richard was so honest because he could make that funny. The honesty wasn't the, the only thing, but a lot of people saw it that way. This is uh, Richard's uh, wife, 
Jennifer Lee Pryor talking about Richard and his honesty. A lot of people are coming at me. Why are you publishing his diaries? That was private. Well, actually, no, he intended it to be published. Uh, and it's and it's just terrific stuff because he really addresses sexuality in it, which I think right now we're 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 catching the zeitgeist of that too, right? We're in a period of time where uh, there's a lot of gender bending and and um, the LGBTQ community is is very strong and has a strong voice now. And Richard addresses uh, bisexuality and his experiences uh, with men, and there is no shame in that. No shame. No shame. Uh, and, and he doesn't have shame when he writes about it. He writes about it very openly. I will read anything on that diary, too. I'm going to find that. Fa First of all, I thought it was fascinating that Richard kept a diary. And I can't imagine any other reason that he would uh, have written it instead of he thought, OK, this will lead to a book. I don't see him as the type of guy doing it for himself. I could be completely wrong. This is the biggest comic in the country right now, Kevin Hart, talking about the honesty of Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, first and foremost, is way ahead of his time. You're looking at one of the most innovative, creative comedians who ever touched a microphone. When being honest and, and authentic is now celebrated, this is a guy who knew it way before. He's gone. Of course, he's not forgotten. You know, we can only hope to become a conversation piece like he was. I appreciate all that he has done, and I appreciate the blueprint that he has laid out for so many of us to follow. Richard Pryor, simply thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for putting your imprint on comedy. I don't know whether we're all going to raise our champagne glasses to that, but uh, Kevin Hart, very appreciative of Richard Pryor and the honesty that he brought in. This is Terry Crews. Never got to meet Richard Pryor um, while he was alive, and that's one of my biggest regrets because, you know, I think he is really the reason I'm here in so many ways. Um, I loved his movies, I loved his acting, I loved everything he was about. And he really, really, you know, took comedy in an amazing, uh, an amazing direction. And my favorite special is Richard Pryor, live on the Sunset Strip. And I'll never forget that whole, you know, they used to play, uh, this is back when they had commercials about the comedy on TV. And he was like, you know, when you're on fire, people will get out of your way you know and and i'll never forget that clip and uh just you know this man he was super super influential simply because of the raw honesty he was very very honest about his own failures and put it out on stage every night his own insecurities and he you know a lot of times you realize he had to laugh to keep from crying the man had a very very tragic life like most comedians and most people who are very, very funny and, uh, you know, chose to share it with us. So I'm very, very thankful for Richard Pryor's transparency. Terry Crews talking about Richard Pryor and his early kind of fandom, which all of us went through at one point or another. And, you know, you could be the, well, we heard from Kevin Hart, who's probably as popular as a comedian as you could possibly get. And he started as a fan. But was always curious to me is what if you were in Richard's life? And I, I talked to his daughter, Rain Pryor, about this. Like, how weird would it be when you, like, you just discover that your dad is Richard Pryor? Because that must have not dawned on her for a long time. I mean, you're just a kid. Your dad's coming home from work. He's in a good mood or a bad mood. And then one day you find out that this guy that you know as your dad is Richard Pryor. I think when I saw him live in 1979 in Long Beach, I was wow. like, oh my God, it was amazing. You know, wars of people just laughing hysterically and rolling and you're like, that's my dad. That's what he does. Ah, you know, and, and he was the same way. You know, he, he was more, um, he was big on stage, obviously, but he was like that at home. Like it was just about truth and honesty. And he kind of like, we stuck with that. Right. You know, he gave that to us. Like, I don't know how to be very filtered. That's fascinating to me. Bobby Kelly has put together this uh, stage show called Creeps with Kids, and it's about comics who are parents, whether the fathers or the mothers. And there's a very, there's a very common thing that I didn't know before, but I, I have from hosting this show for Bobby, and that's a get, comedians tend to talk to their children as if they are people. I've never, I, I never knew that going into it. 
But I think one of the the weird thing about being a parent is that you tend to talk down to the kids about things like they don't get it. And I always felt like comedians were just way up more front. And to hear that from Rain, that's fascinating to me. This is uh, Richard Pryor, A Life in Comedy. And some of the greatest people uh, working in comedy all time talking about Richard. And I don't think that you're going to get, you're not going to be in a conversation about Richard Pryor without drugs coming up and the fire. And I always thought one of the most fascinating things about Richard, and there's plenty of things to be fascinated by, but that the fire didn't kill him. Isn't that weird when you think about that? The fire did not kill him. And he came back and told stories about it. And, you know, did Jojo Dancer, which was just this way of showing what actually happened. And Pryor would have died. He would have become a, a different kind of martyr, I believe. But he took the drug thing as far as you can go, I believe. I don't know if you could go any farther. I, I think even a lot of people who end up on the streets, because the only thing that, that kept Richard from being on the streets at that point was that he had money. But I don't know if they were ever in worse shape than Richard was. And they come back from that and make comedy out of it. Make comedy out of being suicidal. The worst kind of suicide you could think of. Dude, shoot yourself. What are you doing lighting yourself on fire? It's way too painful. He came back and this is his, his wife, Jennifer Lee, prior talking about some of the dark days. There was something dark about Richard when he wasn't on stage. And comics are like that. I mean, there's a there's a, a gloominess and a depression and a and a uh, a moody moodiness that's going on, um, sullenness. Uh, and many times I would make Richard laugh and try to get him out of these moods, right? But um, you know, then he would do cocaine and drink, and of course you'd get that bravado. Mm. But uh, when people say to me, oh my gosh, it must have been so much fun living with Richard. Was it 24-7 jokes? Oh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. There is a bill to pay indeed. And uh, and that's it. That's the price. I did an unmask with Paul Mooney. And um, Paul was, you know, a co-writer with Richard and a friend. And um, Paul had told me, you know, that the, and I was very amazed by this. How can you be friends with a guy who's a drug addict when you don't do drugs at all? Normally, when you get to be a really bad addict, you leave your non-addict friends behind. But Richard and Paul Mooney, they were together when one of them was doing drugs and one wasn't. This is Paul Mooney talking about those addicted times. That's what Richard loved about me, that I didn't do drugs. He loved it. And I knew he loved me because he never tried to seduce me to do drugs. Never. He never, ever said to me, try it. Misery loves company. Mm -hmm. Try it. You, you'll like it. Here, Paul, this view. He would always tell everybody. Like, we were sitting here. Sitting, we were all here, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the drug dealers and everything. And Richard would tell them, Paul doesn't do drugs. Give me his. More for me. More for me. <laughs> <laughs> And that's real. He never, yeah. ever, no, he never, ever. And he, he was like that. It was just great. One of the great comedians of all time, one of the great storytellers of all time. And um, I asked Jennifer Lee Pryor what she thought about the relationship of Paul Mooney and Richard Pryor. Paul didn't get high. Paul liked his Quavassier and Coke. Yeah. Um, he claimed he, you know, Paul to me is a very dark character. Uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of fondness in my heart for him because I saw his bitterness up close. He, he had a love-hate relationship with Richard. Um, and I think, you know, I can't say that he started Richard on drugs. Uh, but I can say that he was somebody who watched the circus from mm. the sidelines and, uh, sometimes it was a voyeuristic uh, sort of demeanor that was um, unkind, if I if I can say that. Um, and Paul, the as the years go by, Paul takes a lot of a lot of credit <laughs> that he damn well shouldn't be taking for writing Richard's material, and I know that firsthand. Sandra Bernhard, uh, the great great comedian and actress, singer, and also host here 
at SiriusXM. I got into uh, an unmasked conversation with her as well about knowing Pryor and Mooney back in those days. He was battling a lot of demons from his childhood, yeah. things that we can't relate to, you know, or imagine. I mean, you know, I think his mother, you know, was, was turning tricks and, you know, he was like lived in a whorehouse and shit. So, you know, he had, he had a, a very rarefied childhood and I think it just, you know, totally form, formulated who he became as an adult. And no amount of the success could but heal su that I think all. success in those situations is, is, more, is more dangerous, actually. Because it's just like you, you, because you're constantly like doubting yourself, and then you're self-deprecating and tearing yourself apart on a on this sort of you know cellular level, mm. and like you're like, why do I deserve this? I'm a piece of shit. You know what I mean? And then you have to go out and like do the do the thing. So it's like this constant you know head-on internal collision. You know, there's a thing in music, and uh, you know, Pryor was even in Lady Sings the Blues, where we idolize the the drug addict that has some creativity and it's probably been too over romanticized because you look back on this and you're like well did the drugs help or did they hurt and even the people who think that the drugs helped for a little while have to admit uh that they put up a shield between that talent and us and uh, a lot of times you'll sit back and go what could it have been what no matter how good it was could it have been better if the drugs didn't show up. Uh, this is the very funny Jay Moore. Because Pryor's got that one hour that's fucking transcendental, never been done before. I got lit on fire. I got hit by a car. Right. My dog pissed on me when I was in the front yard having a heart attack. I was in the burn unit at the hospital. It sounds like a Metallica set list, not a comedy set list, right? <laughs> and you're like, that's the hour. But then like every time I watch like Live on the Sunset Strip, I'm like, he's high and this is awful. Like it's uncomfortable. And I have like, Bicentennial nigger and all this. Hey, watch it. And all these other like albums like that. That I, I'm right. gonna keep saying the N word. That nigger's crazy. That's the name of the album. That nigger's crazy. Like right. it's like ah, I don't. I don't know what. Where were you going with that, Jay? One more time, Paul Mooney. It was frightening because everybody was saying that he was dead. I mean, the word was out that he did that he'd burn up. It was crazy. It was very scary because Richard was like a cat. I always told him he had he was born with a horseshoe up his behind because he had nine lives. He had been through a lot, but not not this. This was scary. This was very, very scary. And I was working somewhere, way out somewhere, and someone, because I couldn't drive, someone had to bring me back, and then I went to the hospital with Mitzi Shore, the owner of the, com the, owner of the comedy store. And uh, I went out. I waited. And then Richard had sent for me, and uh, I'd... I went to the hospital. I was going to the room, and it was the big burn ward. And then, so when I came in, Richard made an ugly, ugly face. You know, Doctor Frankenstein. You know, like it was very funny, but very <laughs> sad. But it, but it was the the humor was always there, and uh, it was just good to see him alive. You know, I mean, he really. I mean, he should have been dead. You know, he was just he was meant to be here. He wasn't meant to go. Again, it's so strange to think that he lived through that no matter what you say about richard Pryor, if you go to the the place that uh jay went where he was saying you know some of this stuff is a little overblown i can't think of anybody who's a bigger influence on comedy and i'm not sure that i can even think of another art form who has somebody who looms over it that way maybe playwriting and shakespeare well, let's face it, a lot of people don't even know if he was a real person or if there was eight people. It's, it gets complicated. He's one of the greatest influences of all time to anything. And here are some great comedians talking about this. This is uh, Jim Norton. Watching Richard Pryor um, in 1979, 1980 on my TV with my parents, watching live in concert. It's the best stand-up ever done, Richard Pryor live in concert. Um, I always was funny. I always made people laugh. But I didn't know what to do with that. I would write stories when I was a little kid and, and love when they would be read and people would be laughing. But I didn't understand what comedy was. And I watched him. And I was, it, was a, it was like, ah, 
that's what you do with it. So yeah, that's that which for me was the moment. What was it because he was making you laugh or you saw other people in your life laugh? Both. My parents were laughing, yeah. I was laughing, and he was making people with that was done in Long Beach, California. Pryor made pimps laugh. Fucking Huey P. Newton. He <laughs> fucking under he introduced Huey Newton. You know how radical you have to be? I introduced Opie and Anthony, and that shouldn't be done. He fucking introduced Huey P. Newton, the fucking leader of the Black Panthers, man. Those are the guys he made laugh. I mean, well, he was so beautiful because he was, he was doing really necessary and poignant racial stuff. And it was needed, and it was genuine, but he never, he never tried to make you feel guilty. I love that about him. He never tried to make you feel guilty about being a white guy, so you didn't have that out. You had to acknowledge it because he was just accurately portraying things. I mean, he was beautiful, man. He really was. Man, that was amazing what Norton just said about that. I'm trying to think if we ever felt accused for being white when we were listening to the prior when we were younger. And I, and I think his, he's right. I always thought it was like so funny when Richard would say like white people talk like this or white people walk like that because... I had never heard white people point it out. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times people say Italians do this, Jews do that. But no one just said, here's a general white thing. And it was so funny to me. And that's when I kind of realized when I was younger, like, oh, yeah, we live in the suburbs. But, yeah, I'm, I, I just went back over what Norton said. I don't think we felt accused and that we would come to... Uh, the end of the story based on how we got ourselves there. Where you could go like, hey, maybe white people could lighten up a little bit. Here's Howie Mandel. Nobody changed my life more professionally than Richard Pryor. And I moved out to uh, California in the late 70s. And Richard Pryor started showing up at the comedy store to write live on the Sunset Strip, which was uh, a seminal uh, kind of uh, concert film that he did of his stand-up. And it was the first time that I realized that somebody was that brave, that honest, and that, um, you know, uh, about things that were kind of like hurtful and edgy, and whether he was talking about him being uh, burned in his freebasing accident or uh, being raised by, you know, in a, in a house of ill repute. He, you could see that it was real. And it was the first time I knew that this was a comic that wasn't just doing jokes, but a comic that was talking about real experiences and he was making them funny and and he was fearless because he would try out these things and he'd show up every night and sometimes it wouldn't work and then he would hone it and the next night it would work amazingly and i just watched his work ethic and his honesty and i thought i feel like i'm doing so little and it kind of informed how i perform now i don't perform anything not even close to what richard Pryor is but i love him and he's my idol once again, this is uh, Paul Feig talking about Richard as an influence. Richard Pryor was just uh, such an amazing game changer for for all of us in comedy. You know, first of all, I grew up in the Midwest in Michigan, and um, you know, comedy had all been fairly safe. I mean, you know, we, we listened to Carlin and all the, all, you know, and, and Lenny Bruce and all that in the past, but it was. Pryor was the one who was saying motherfucker all the time. <laughs> and I remember just that was kind of almost is a kid who grew up religiously in the Midwest. It was like, oh, gosh, he's almost this is kind of scary. Like, am I allowed to listen to these albums because they're they are so, you know, advanced in that way. But the minute you started listening to him, you just realized nobody was expressing themselves the way that uh, the Richard Pryor was. That was Paul Feig talking about Richard Pryor. And here are two guys that I think uh, just have it all in front of them. And it's Derek Gaines and Monroe Martin. And here's a guy that, like I said, I don't even know if they were born yet when a lot of this stuff happened, but I, you could put these guys on Jeopardy. You put Derek Gaines on Jeopardy tomorrow and he's going to win the entire Richard Pryor row of questions. Uh, this is them talking about him as an influence, Derek Gaines and Monroe Martin. He was the first defiant one. We think of like, for, for me, defiant. To go on stage, there's a lot of niggas in here tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they go, yeah, and a lot of white people here too. You know, yeah. A lot of hockey stuff. <laughs> like, just to be able to go, in my in, in, a, in a sense, it feels like, if you ever seen Django Bennington, when Jamie Foxx was on the horse, and everybody was like, who the fuck is that? 
who was yeah. Richard was my black dude on a horse, right? Because he was doing stuff nobody did. Everybody was in chains walking to the plantation, while Jamie Foxx was on the horse guiding it. Like yeah. this is some wow. Yeah. So Richard was the dude, the trailblazer. But that's for me. fearlessness because you already got you come you come from nothing. He got his ass beat a lot. The mom's on drugs, raised in a whorehouse. It's like, what can y'all do to me? Yeah. yeah. What can y'all do to me that I wasn't born into? Plus, I already do drugs. I'm already fucking my life up <laughs> as it's going on. So yeah. what could you possibly do? Yeah, what can you do? That's Derek Gaines and Monroe Martin talking about Richard kind of being a starting point for them. And I always think about this. A lot of comedians will bring up Richard as an influence. But most of them never had the chance to see him live. We have the live specials, but that's certainly a different uh, kind of way to deal with it. And you have to also remember those specials came out in a movie theater. People would go to a movie theater and sit down and watch uh, this. Here's Doug Stanhope talking about being a kid and being influenced by Richard's work. Live on the Sunset Strip, there were two that came out, if I'm not mistaken, that to go to see stand-up comedy in a movie theater, when you're kind of new to movie theaters themselves, was absolutely stunning. And we'd quote Richard Pryor. We'd also quote Bill Cosby from the turntable. But fortunately, the parents died before that all turned sour. But uh, yeah, Richard Pryor was not much of a fucking uh, a better beast as a fucking homemaker either. But he was fucking funny and honest. And that and a thousand things probably queered me into the state that I'm in now. Fortunately, I didn't, uh, unlike a whole generation or two of comics, rip Richard Pryor off so badly that now to go back and listen to him kind of seems hackneyed. So yeah, fucking be your own prior and leave his prior alone, you fucks. Be your own prior, leave his prior alone. And I do think, I do think that there's some wisdom to that, man. Like when you look at Richard, you and, and people talk about starting there, you do want to find out like, can I figure out how to take this stuff to the stage? You know, what's ever bothering you, what's ever makes you unique. And he did that. And to talk to an old pal of ours uh, that is no longer with us, and that's Patrice O'Neill. And he had a way of putting it that I never forgot. So I'm just going to share Patrice. Uh, this was an unmasked that I did with him when he was describing what both Carlin and Pryor brought to comedy. Yeah, I want to I wanna change lives, but but not be profound about it. You know, right. that's why I think Richard Pryor was who, who he was. And I think George Carlin is who he is. And I, I put them one and two because I think they both have a righteousness because George Carlin's story is heavy, man. He was already a millionaire. And Richard Pryor was already a millionaire. And they state just had some, this is wrong. This sucks. Even though they got the millions, but they, they went down. I mean, their lifestyle went down. Being righteous. Patrice talking about that, that they were willing to give up the mainstream success that they were having to go in this other direction. And they turned out both to be very, very right. Um, and, you know, Stanhope uh, mentioned some stuff that a lot of folks have mentioned through here about, you know, as much as we respect Pryor's work, there's a lot of lessons there to learn what not to do. So we're going to let uh, somebody who married him twice close out this show. This is Jennifer Lee Pryor. I shared the other night that at one point I took a refuge at a, I took refuge at a, a hotel, the Lemertage. It doesn't exist any longer. I'm Burton Way out here. And uh, Mitzi found me and tracked me down, called me up and gave me a dissertation on the the comic psyche, how fragile they are, how um, sensitive, complicated they are, and how I needed to understand that. Of course, there was very little understanding for me, yeah. you know, to hell with me that I was literally hiding out in a hotel at that point. Um, 
Yeah, it was hard, but you know, um, I took the ride with Richard. It was a ride or die situation. And um, I was that ride or die person. I hung in there. I, 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 wild horses couldn't have dragged me away until, of course, it got dangerous and I had to get out of Dodge, right? Yeah. And that's when that's when those serious drugs moved in, and I said, I can't, I'm, I can't, I can't hang with this. It got, it was frightening, and I, I needed to literally protect myself. Um, but we got through that eventually, and um, and as you know, I returned to take care of him. I never stopped loving Richard. I um, adored him. I still do. I miss him so much. I miss him to this day. Even when he was sick, I would go into his room and sit with him, and we would just connect. I mean, I never had that sort of connection before in my life, and um, and but I never felt seen until Richard, and Richard saw me. That was how lovable he was. He saw me. Oftentimes, of course, when the fame and the drugs obliterated that ability, it was never forgotten and it would it, it eventually reemerged. But his recognition of people, he could see people's souls. I mean, he absolutely could and appreciate them. And, um, you know, I, I just can't tell you um, how special a man he was. You know, people think about Richard as, oh, he beat women up. Yeah, he did beat me up a few times. And I've got a good right, too. And I fought back. Uh, and I stayed, okay? But uh, I'm not making excuses here. I'm just telling it like it is. Uh, there was violence. Um, uh, but, you know, I, 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 as I said, I stayed. But people think about, oh, he beat women up. He did drugs. Yes, and that was a symptom of, of some, some bad stuff that was going on with him. Uh, but take that away and you had a seriously kind, good person inside. I mean, just, you know, the most giving and um, I just miss him and so much. And I work very hard to maintain his legacy because I want people to know about Richard. Really, I'm desperate for people to continue to, to love him and to understand him and to be acquainted with his work. What a complicated genius. And Jennifer Lee Pryor is bringing out more material by Richard. It's something that's going to be talked about for a long, long time. And in the one hour, you could just scrape. Hopefully, you're, if you're not as familiar with him or you haven't thought about him for a while, there's a lot more stuff out there. Richard Pryor, A Life in Comedy. I want to thank Kevin Hart, Joan Rivers, Paul Mooney. Tracy Morgan, Paul Feig, Louis Anderson, Sandra Barnhart, Jay Moore, Jim Norton, Howie Mandel, Doug Stanhope, Patrice O'Neill, Jennifer Lee Pryor, Rain Pryor, Roy Wood Jr., Marlon Wayans, Derek Gaines, Monroe Martin, and Terry Crews. And this has been Richard Pryor, A Life in Comedy.